Good evening, everyone. A great, huge thank you to our sponsors for tonight. Our lead sponsors, Karen and Ford Reiki, our corporate sponsors, Maine Health and Wilbur's Chocolate. Um, and <laughs> if anyone puts on weight tonight, it's their fault, not my fault. Okay. And our many, many seasoned supporters. Um, without them and with your, without your ticket sales, none of this would be possible. Uh, tonight's proceeds, as we always do, uh, to a different organization are to Meeting House Arts to support this wonderful venue and the many great things that Meeting House Arts is doing in the Freeport community. <laughs> now a little um, fun. I need just a second to clear. So where do I sit on that? On the left hand one? On this one? You've all heard of the Emmys. <laughs> this is the free me. Okay? This is an award. <laughs> the nominees, the top uh, events that we have here. So just to review for you, the nominees this year are Heather Cox Richardson, who spoke about the a role of Maine in the development of our democracy, our republic and our democracy. The second nominee was Senator Angus King, who spoke about the art of politics, teaching us all a little bit about how things work or don't work in Washington. The third nominee was or is, excuse me, Admiral Gregory Johnson and diplomat Ambassador Susan Thornton, who enlightened us about the Ukraine. And tonight's nominee is Dr. Nirav Shah, Professor Kara, pa Kara Palamountain, and Dr. Dora Mills. And the winner is... Oh, we've got two more lectures. <laughs> we um, wanted to let you know that on September 29th, we have a wonderful lecture about the environment. Um, we're honored to have Susanna Hancock with us tonight. It will be one of our featured speakers, Susanna. <coughs> I broke her arm to get her to speak. And Dr. Ian Kerr, who is the CEO of Ocean Alliance, which does amazing research using whales as their platform about what's happening in the oceans. And then that's on September 29th, Thursday, September 29th. Tickets will go on sale a month before. And then on... October 20th, before the election, we have very fortunate to have Colin Woodard speaking on his views on how to save our democracy. So perhaps after that, we'll have a, we'll have a winner here. But um, so now, without much more, um, a little bit about our speakers tonight. I think everybody knows an awful lot about Dr. Nerov Shah. And I'm, if you didn't read last month's or this month's Down East Magazine, go get a copy and you'll learn a little bit more. But we all know an awful lot, but not a lot of people know as much about his wife, Professor Kara Palamountain. And you're gonna learn a lot about her tonight. Um, she is internationally, she's better known than Nerov. But here in Maine, she's, um, just a friend, which is wonderful. And it, moderating that discussion will be Dr. Dora Ann Mills, who's become a dear friend of mine and is truly wonderful. So without further ado, Nirav Shah, Kara Palamountain. Thank you, John. And Dora Ann Mills. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks. I think we're ready to roll. I think we're ready to roll. Ready to roll. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to be here and uh, be here, particularly with my uh, good friends Kara and Nura. Um, and I'm excited because of the fact I've known um, both of them now for several years, and we've gotten to be good friends. And I've often told, uh, shared with Nerav that the best kept secret um, is Kara. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. Um, anyway, so I think we'll I can start out though with you, Nerav, and uh, you know the last two and a half years. Take a deep breath. <laughs> you <laughs> you really helped to uh, hold our hand uh, in many ways through this last two and a half years. So I know on behalf of everybody, we all thank you so much for for getting us through this time. Um, that's, 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 and thank you, Kara, for helping to get him through this time, too. Yeah. On our yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you helped to calm us a great deal, um, especially those early days. Was it 2 o'clock in the afternoon? We all tuned in? There are boats. There are yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for one hour. And... Uh, but there had to have been times when you were sleepless, up at night, worried. What was the scariest time during the last two and a half years of this pandemic? Was there a time that you can look back and think, got through that? Boy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. And thank you all for coming out. It is an honor to see so many faces in the crowd and in the audience. Uh, thanks to Tom, our colleagues here in Freeport, uh, as well as the sponsors for this evening for bringing us all together. Kara and I are really, really delighted uh, to be here. And Dora, I'll start. I mean, you, you, you noted sleepless nights. And I mean, the fact is, I pretty much sleep like a baby. Um, that is to say, waking up, crying and screaming about every two hours, terrified of what might be going on. Um, and that, that, I think, largely typifies the experience that, that I had at certain points in the pandemic. There were, there were moments that were certainly scarier than others. I think there are, there are two that really, three that really come to mind that, that crystallize things. The first is um, being on a call uh, with my colleagues from other states and some experts, experts from the CDC. And they were, this was around about the end of March of 2020, so the first few weeks. And our colleagues from the CDC were presenting data on what we knew uh, from China, largely, about how the virus was transmitting. And a lot of this is mathematical data. But a lot of us, when we started plugging those numbers into a model, it made it very clear that this virus was doing something different from other respiratory viruses, which is that it was transmitting before people had symptoms. That is a much different world from other respiratory viruses like influenza. The reason we don't regularly have influenza pandemics is that, for the most part, influenza transmits once you start developing symptoms. And you can control it because you're at home, you're in bed. With COVID, when we saw those data, I think all of us, I think we were on the phone then because Zoom wasn't even a thing, we all sort of collectively had a pause because that's when we realized this was going to be much different. And that is, I think, around the time when I started saying, okay, it's this, this, is, this is where it's going to be. This is not China, Maine we have to be worried about. This is the real thing from China. That was the first thing. The second was, although we knew that large outbreaks were going to be likely in congregate settings, it wasn't until we had the, really, the first one that caused significant, unfortunately, death. Uh, this was at a nursing facility in Waldo County called Tall Pines. And those first calls with them, letting them know that the worst was to come for them and their patients, that was really difficult. And that is really scary to be on the phone with doctors and administrators and say to them, it has arrived in your facility, it has breached your walls, and things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, that was very, very difficult. The third was around about a year ago when we first started seeing data, um, some of it coming out of Massachusetts from Provincetown where it became, again, mathematically clear that people, even who had been vaccinated, were still harboring the virus and transmitting it to others, what we now know as a breakthrough case. Because that essentially resets the clock. What we all thought a year and three months ago would be the final days of the pandemic 
when the data became clear that it would indeed go much further, that's sort of a, well, it's time to rename the virus. Yep. It's no longer COVID-19. It's now going to be COVID-2021, 22, 23, there on and there forth. So those were the three moments that I thought, boy, just when we thought we were yeah. done, they pull us back in again. So five years from now, 10 years from now, yeah. this isn't going away anytime COVID, soon. COVID is going to be with us. It will ebb and flow as do other seasonal respiratory viruses. Some weeks will be better. Some weeks will be worse. Some seasons will be worse. Some seasons will be better. But COVID as we know it right now is not going away. What is largely in the rearview mirror, however, is COVID as an emergency. An emergency necessitating the deployment of governmental uh, extraordinary powers, uh, the cessation of surgical procedures, the bypassing of primary care, the shutting down of society. I think there are good, very good reasons to believe that COVID as an emergency is something that's behind us. COVID as an infectious disease, that's going to be with us. Wow. What, what, could you look back and see there's maybe one decision, maybe two, that were the best decisions oh. you could have made? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me the worst. Oh, well, you can I, I like, I like one. the worst decisions. <laughs> okay, I mean, best and the worst. <laughs> okay, so I, yeah, I think, I think we have an, you know, so I, I, let me talk about why I'm so focused on the worst decisions because I think I we have a softball. No, it, it was, and I appreciate that, but I don't, I don't, I don't do softballs. Um, I, I think we have an obligation going forward to think about why we were, as a country, so ill prepared for this pandemic. In fact, I'll refine that even further. We were generally prepared for the pandemic. I think the question is, why did we respond so poorly? We spend more on healthcare. We spend more on preparedness. The United States tops the charts in every metric of pandemic preparedness out there. But yet our response was so lackluster. And I think we have a big project ahead of us to ask other public health officials, what was the worst set of decisions? So I'll, do, I'll try to do both. Um, in terms of the decision, I don't necessarily want to call it the best. That, that's probably presupposing more than I, I wish to ascribe to it. But the decision that I think was among the boldest that I stand by was our decision in Maine to vaccinate solely by age. Hugely controversial. Took a lot of heat for it and still do, but I stand by it. Because what we saw unfolding in other states was general confusion about who could be vaccinated and who was eligible at what time periods. And what we've learned, I think, for certainty is that in a pandemic situation, a lack of clarity essentially means that folks don't have what they need to act. So our approach provided that clarity, uh, even though it was with, not without controversy. Uh, the worst decision or the decision that I, I feel like in retrospect uh, left the most to be desired nationally, I'm not just referring to Maine here, was the manner in which children were kept out of school. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something where, in the proverbial, uh, if, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, yeah. uh, I would be uh, even more ardent in keeping kids in school. I'm proud that we did not uniformly shut down schools in Maine relative to some of our counterpart states on the West Coast, which are still, believe it or not, evaluating whether to send kids into the classroom this year, let alone in 2019. We, we, we never came close to that. But that would be the one decision that I think we have the wow. most to learn from. Wow. So you would you would lean more towards keeping them open and getting kids in. And even if that means masking and Indeed. all those kinds of Indeed. things. Indeed. Um, well, interesting. Thank you so much. The, um, the, I want to start switching over to our <laughs> other <laughs> guest here on the, on the, on the floor. Um, you know, because of COVID, uh, we've got this really strong sense of what public health can do in the U.S. or can and can't do. Um, but we also know it's a global, it's been a global issue. And Kara actually works globally. Um, and I've been fortunate to get to know her the last several years. And, but I want to ask you first about your resume, because <laughs> you've got an MBA at Northwestern. You're from Austin, Texas, uh, originally. Went to undergraduate there. And then you now are co-principal investigator of a $68 million dollar health grant across a good part of Africa, Gates Foundation, I think, primarily. So tell me, how do you connect the dots between getting an MBA 
and then being a PI, principal investigator on a health grant in Africa. There's a, that's a, that's a, a journey in there that I'd, I'd like to hear more about. Great. Um, well, let me take you on a journey. Dora. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you, first of all, Dora and Tom, for that wonderful introduction, and Nira for sharing a bit of the stage um, with, and for the audience for being here. Um, so my name is Kara Palamountain. I'm a professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, which is the business school. And I teach students, um, but I primarily have focused on research um, on one fundamental question. Why do technologies that have existed for decades and are readily accessible in hospitals and physician offices in the US not available in countries in Africa? Why? So we have technologies that have bridged that divide in Africa. Mobile phones, smartphones are ubiquitous. Mobile banking is almost better in Africa. Supply chains for Coke and Diet Coke mm -hmm. are well-functioning. Diet yes. Coke, really? Yes. And beer. <laughs> yes. And there's sophisticated equipment that supports and technology that supports those supply chains. But why are medical technologies different? And so the first decade of my career was focused on trying to answer that question using one hypothesis. Medical technologies are not designed for those settings. So with funding from philanthropic organizations and some large diagnostic companies, we set out to focus on improving testing for HIV facilities in Africa. And so where we started was not just lifting what they might have at Maine CDC or Maine Health um, in their laboratories there for HIV testing, but really starting from a different design point, the HIV clinic in Africa. And so we designed point of care HIV tests for babies. Many of you are familiar with the technology now, thanks to the COVID pandemic, it's PCR based or antigen based technology. And we were trying to solve a problem that a mother with and that was HIV positive was facing, was her baby positive or negative? And what we saw is that a mother would have to wait up to four months for that result. I think all of us have waited too long for COVID testing results in the past couple of years. But imagine being a mother not knowing whether your baby was positive for four months. So we reduced that turnaround time from four months down to less than an hour with some technology that we developed. Wow. wow. Hanging out with where newborns were um, presenting in, in, in HIV clinics in Africa, we got to see where other babies were that were HIV negative, maybe were premature, small, and sick. And so a group of us decided that we would shift our focus, and this is where the second decade of my career has started shifting, is really thinking about newborn mortality. 50% of under five deaths are in babies that are in their first week of life. And how can we make that end? We have the technologies to do this. We need to invest in newborn care in, in the hospitals in Africa. And so with 14 institutions, the majority of which are African institutions, we have installed 65 newborn wards in four countries in Africa, um, Nigeria, Tanzania, Kenya, and Malawi. And we don't do a, you know, we have, well, Barbara Bush Hospital is an exemplar of NICU care in, in, in the US. We don't just do a blueprint of their staffing ratios, their equipment, and their floor plan um, and, and export it into Africa. We really work in partnerships with ministries of health to do those things and improve those areas of the hospitals one, um, one, one at a time. So that's a little bit about me and provides a little bit of context of the MBA to, to the, <laughs> the, the projects that I've spent two decades working on. Yeah, so you continue, you go to Africa, like, because I remember every few weeks, I mean, you normally go to Africa. So one of the, usually one of those four countries. Um, so when I first met you, you were like going back and forth between here in Chicago and here in, in, uh, in Nigeria and Tanzania. But that came to a stop for a while. Um, and but you've gone back a couple of times recently. So what are your observations around how the pandemic is going there, the 
COVID pandemic? Yeah, so um, my first stop was to Tanzania, um, and Tanzania's um, former president, or late president, actually died of COVID and was a, a bit of a, a COVID denier. But um, I was actually surprised to see um, the percentage uptake of the vaccine um, since I had been there. It was um, roughly 10 to 20 percent. Um, but when I first went there, um, you know, I was I was taken aback and I was actually surprised at the masking and, and um, some different activities that were taking place. How, you mean lots of masking? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, in Malawi even more so most recently. Wow. Um, but, you know, the, the uptake generally in Africa for COVID vaccines has been around 20%. Um, because and of not wanting it or they don't have it or both? A little bit of, it's been a little bit of both. Um, <laughs> I think right now it's, it's the supply is no longer the issue. Um, in the early days of it, it was a big issue. And um, there were some donations made where there would be sort of like a month left on the, the expiry date of the vaccine. But I think largely the supply issues have been worked through as every country was dealing with sort of supply chain issues and no one could get enough vaccine at the time. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of brings us to this global pandemic that we've been um, experiencing. So what are, um, what are some of the lessons we've learned for how to prepare for the next pandemic? I, kind of, I would ask both of you, I know this is something you're working on actively, but you also maybe have some insights to that. So you want to start, Kara? Sure. Go for um, it. Okay. So, and the next pandemic after monkeypox is going to after monkeypox <laughs> and everything else. Yeah. yeah. So I I think um, there are already pandemics, you know, many uh, outbreaks that are occurring. I think Africa has 140 unique out disease outbreaks per year, and having genomic sequencing be able to strengthen not only genomic sequencing to be able to detect which viruses are coming out. How can we actually design devices, <laughs> diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines for emerging outbreaks, I think would be really reliant on a really good genomic sequencing framework, but also a data sharing framework across the different sequencing labs across different countries. Um, I also believe that we can't take our eye off the ball on vaccinations. There's been a slide in childhood vaccinations uh, I think diphtheria, um, the, the DPT vaccine has dropped five percentage points, which is the largest slide in 30 years. And so really making sure we catch up and do catch up vaccine clinics for, for diseases that we have very well validated, used for decade vaccines um, to use. So, As Tora noted, I've been thinking a lot about and working with colleagues uh, at the federal level and, uh, and other states around this vexing question, which is how could it be that the United States is so prepared on paper, but yet simultaneously so ill-equipped to respond when the chips are down, other than in Maine, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> and um, it, it's concerning for so many reasons, uh, the, not least of which is that COVID-19, let alone monkeypox, is not going to be the last dance with infectious diseases coming from other parts of the globe. And yet we spend all this money, we have this stockpile, we have all these tabletop exercises and drills, and indeed we now have an entire operational division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, formerly an office, now an entire operational division uh, of preparedness and response, but yet when called upon, uh, we collectively generally fall down a little bit. And it's quite vexing. Uh, now, let's note that some of it is due to funding. The way that public health has been funded is, I, I joke, but it's true, it's a lot like the snow in Maine. It's plentiful in January and then gone by July. And that's how we often fund public health preparedness. Something comes along and then we throw a ton of money at it, but then six months later, a year later, that money's gone. So there's this Sisyphean battle between pushing money out and then finding it gone when you need it for the next one. So that's a perennial issue. And we've seen in the United States going back, well, decades, but most in, in modern history, from Ebola, then SARS, 
then Zika, and then SARS-CoV-2, now with monkeypox. There are other reasons that I think pandemics shine a light on that are going to be sociological and anthropological as much as they are governmental. I mean, when I was a kid, if there was something that we really didn't want, that we wanted other people to stay away from, that we wanted them to avoid, we would say we should avoid it like the plague. <laughs> now we know that people don't avoid the plague in the United States. The plague's not a thing. Like, so we got to retire that slogan because no one's avoiding the plague. I mean, who could have guessed that something as simple as a face covering would become as politically talismanic as it has? So there are these almost unanticipatable behavioral factors that unfortunately generated a high degree of path dependence into what states fared well during COVID and which ones didn't. Um, so what our charge going forward, at least as a community of public health practitioners, is, is to really try to figure out why it is and how we can do better at not only being prepared, which we generally are. Our coffers are filled with supplies and such, but how we can turn that preparedness into a response um, this is one of the things that, that my colleagues and I have really been trying to, to get our head around. Um, I think, I think it's, it's almost, it almost rises to the level of an existential question. Yeah. I, I would put it up there uh, alongside questions like climate change. And of course, there's no surprise that the two are interlinked. Yes. We don't do at all nearly the job we should with respect to contending with diseases where many of them originate in, for example, the parts of the world where Carol works. Monkeypox was first described there and indeed was brewing there for years. And scientists for years sounded the alarm that it could very easily find its way to Western shores. But we just systematically neglect those things. Factors like climate change and urbanization will magnify that risk tenfold. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, have you ever met the Gateses? I'm just curious because you have this, these big Gates Foundation grants. I think I've ever asked you that. I don't, but I look a lot like Melinda Gates. Yes. You do? <laughs> you do. Yes. Google it. Yeah. Yes. Google it and do a side so, by side. I have been mistaken for her a couple of times, but I, of... I am not Melinda Gates, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> you do look a lot like yeah. Melinda French Gates. She yes. There, right? yes. So, but you've not met, I was just no. curious if you've ever no. met them. So, how did you guys meet? Kara, I will Didn't let you to stump you. But yeah, I will. Let, I will let Kara answer that. Yeah. So um, I work a lot with undergraduate and graduate students, and a group of very earnest um, Northwestern students invited me to um, their, I guess, book club or their journal club, where they get together every week and they discuss a, a journal article um, in global health can't say no to like a group yeah. of undergrads <laughs> reading articles and getting together on Friday night. And guess who else was invited? <laughs> <laughs> Did they purposely try to set you up? No, no but no. I had just sent a group of students to Cambodia to explore sort of the availability of testing for infant HIV and kind of mapping that out in Cambodia. And they had met you at that, that same event. And um, they said, oh, you have to meet Nira. He just, he spent a lot of time in Cambodia. And I actually didn't have enough time. Uh, I had to leave to write a grant. And so I just said, hey, can I get your card? Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear about your time in Cambodia. And he thought I was hitting on him. <laughs> I was really, I was really um, actually just interested in Networking. Cambodia. Yes. <laughs> As she referred to it. <laughs> the rest <Yeah>. is history. <laughs> so where, what was your first date like? <laughs> I thought we were networking. Yeah. <laughs> but since he was working, um, and we were both working during the day, we couldn't meet for coffee anywhere convenient. So he picked out like the most romantic <laughs> restaurant. It's like the date place in, in Chicago. And I was like, is this... Is this a date or is this networking? Um, but it was it was still networking at that point. Yes. Um, yes. yes. But I, I guess in hindsight, it was our first date. <laughs> I I agree with that. And how many years? <laughs> so you had two different visions for this first time together. Yes. Sounds like. 
I think that's right. Yeah. You were yes. dating. You I, were was, networking. I, I was in full on first date mode. <laughs> and I Carol got, was like, are you on LinkedIn? What? Yeah. I'm like, I'm on LinkedIn? Yeah. Give me a break. <laughs> yeah. I, he's all mine now. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Um, so God, I have lost my. So how long have you been married? Just celebrated our tenth wedding anniversary. Yep. Oh, yes. When was that? On in June. Oh my. Goodness. Yes. You know the date? <laughs> <laughs> mid, mid June. <laughs> like Close middle Close middle it. June. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. <Yeah>. Next question. <laughs> um, so how have you two weathered the last two and a half years? I mean, you've been consumed with the pandemic management and Maine CDC and everything. And then you've been going back and forth to Chicago and more recently to, because you teach also. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned that you teach, uh, although you've been teaching remotely for a bit, but you've had to go back and forth and then you go to Africa now and then. So, but then you had a bunch of time where you were both here, you were working, you were working, but remotely. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys weather that? I mean, what was, what was dinner like at the Shaw household? And what did you talk about? What did you do? What do you, like, what's it? Well, what's in it normal like? times, dinner at the Shaw Palo Mountain household mm -hmm. would be talking about what are we going to eat next? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, but I think... <laughs> Really, during some of those tough times, it was um, really just uh, giving Nero a space to eat and unwind and not have to tell, not have to talk, um, and just some some time to to unwind. Um, so I think it was sort of one day at a time, sometimes one minute at a time, but really making sure he ate um, and took time out to eat and drink water and not just Diet Coke. <laughs> You know, I, I tell, for the young people who are in the audience, which I think is like the under 85 group, <laughs> unclear, but uh, for, for the younger folks, uh, I, you know, the one thing I, the one thing I, I heard many years ago and I, I've repeated ever since is that uh, one of the most important decisions you can make in life is who you marry. And I could not have been here were it not for Kara. Oh. So. So, yep. so she was kind of your rock yeah, when you got home so. at night. Very much so. Yep. And yeah. so I do know that you like to cook together. I've been the recipient of yeah. a number of those dishes. <laughs> Though I have to say, you, you have cooked some very sophisticated dishes. But one time, you well, maybe it was a year or two ago, you came up to my place and you brought this dish that my kids devoured. <laughs> absolutely devoured. And... <laughs> Then I said, well, I got to get that recipe. And Kara <laughs> leans over to me and she says, it's microwaved, uh, what's the name of it? Velveeta. Velveeta. With Queso. A, with a can of uh, jalapeno. Pe jalapeno. Rotel. Rotel. Yeah. Pe yeah. Peppers. Yeah. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. I don't know. Anyway, it was, just, yeah. it was kind of funny because you guys had made some very sophisticated dishes. And then the one that my kids just devoured was... It was microwave Velveeta with some kind of peppers in it. So, it's yeah, so but, anyway, but you do like to cook we a do. lot. We so do, and, and, and the queso itself, which is as you described it, Kara and I had been dating for maybe two or three months, and uh, I like to make fussy things like that, right? And so we got invited somewhere to some potluck, and I spent all day in the kitchen making all these little fussy things with my tweezers and microgreens, and I was ready to go, and I said, all right, Kara, I got my dish. What are you going to make? And you said, well, I'm just going to take that crock pot and I'm going to put a block of Velveeta in it. I'm going <laughs> to pour some tomatoes in and that's queso. And I was horrified, completely <laughs> horrified. And, and you said, mark my words, this will be the first thing that's gone. <laughs> and sure enough, like 35 minutes into the party, people were like, do, do you have any more of that, that cheese dip? <laughs> That's yeah. True. So I'm, that I'm, was the experience that one time you brought yep, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was like, and now everyone has a recipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. mm -hmm. <clears throat> you didn't know. Yeah. So what are your you you like to cook together? I think that's kind of some. Is that been so therapeutic for you during the pandemic too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And what? Yeah, I think cooking and um, 
Dana I see at the gym. We've started working out about a year ago, and we do that. That's another thing we do together every morning and with Dana. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's been another thing that we tried to carve out some time where we either cook together or go to the gym together it's or walk our, our dog. Walk our dog. So I was going to end with him, but I will, I will do it now. But so people ask, I'm sure whether you have children, so they do have a child. It's a dog child. Um, and he's a, he's a wonderful uh, Quincy. He's kind of a, was it 14 years old? 14 year old, can I say overweight uh, golden retriever? <laughs> He's, well, he's I mean, healthy. He's, he's very healthy. healthy. I mean, he's a little bit. I mean, he's not. He's not. He's just fluffy. He's very fluffy. <laughs> yeah. fluffy. You can tell I'm not a dog person. Yeah. I was like, he looked kind of big yeah. to me. But yeah. anyway, he's a little arthritic. He's not a sweater. He's I mean, he's a sweater. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he's not a weight, overweight. I'm sorry. I apologize to Quincy, but I mean, he's, we all put on a little weight in COVID. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. A little yeah. Possible, but he can Quincy still run into the lake and yeah. back and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So he's kind of your, he's your dog. He's definitely your dog kid. So we, we got him when we had been dating for a year and a half, maybe. Yeah. And so I guess we were at the stage where it was like, so I guess we're getting a dog, huh? <laughs> uh, so this is it. This is it. Yeah. Okay. That was yeah. 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 So, and Quincy's been with us. He was with us when we were in Chicago uh, for a brief period when we were, when I was primarily in Texas caring for my dad. And then now in Maine, which he loves. Yeah. He loves it here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Between the snow, the lakes, the cool weather. I mean, he is, this is by far, both for, for me, Kara, and Quincy, the best place we've lived. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> So when, how, you know, when you were here for a while, how did you know that you just kind of, like, you're now in Maine? I mean, what, what struck you? I, you know, one of my favorite things to do is just to go 20 for minutes from our house to, like, the giant steps or to the Reed's Reed. And I've never lived in a place where 20 minutes from your house is that beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, it was like always like in Houston, it was like, where's 20 minutes to the nearest strip mall? You yeah. know, um, <laughs> 20 minutes so, away looks the same as here. Yeah, in exactly. So yeah. I was really, I think it took me aback. And I think we always look at each other when we go to the giant steps or somewhere like Reed and like, I can't believe you live 20 minutes from here. This yeah. is insane. I think for me, it was the day shortly after we moved here where we got up one morning and we, we thought, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take our dogs swimming in the ocean in the morning and then go skiing in the afternoon. Wow. And, and we realized, wow, there are probably not many places in the United States, yeah. where the continental United States, where that is, where that is possible. Well, uh, where your dog can go swimming in the ocean, and had swim to his heart's content in the morning, and then three or four hours later, you can be on the slopes. That's And I think, I think for me, that was the day where I was like, yep. That's great. We're here. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So um, tell us about what are, the, what are the things you do around Maine? Like what kinds of, I know I think you've been up like camping different places and things like that. Do you want to elaborate what kind of places you've been around Maine? I think our, so initially, and the reason I, I, I like that question is when the opportunity to move here arose, we both sort of looked at each other and said, Maine is exactly the kind of place where we would go on vacation. And so as with so many folks, why not just move there? We could go hiking, cycling, skiing, mountain biking, all in hiking. I said that all the things that we like to do. I'd say top of that list has been hiking. I think we've spent most of our time exploring the various different trails, mountains, parks, uh, all the way from just simple day hikes, all the way to a pretty big set of days we had in Acadia a couple months ago where we tackled all of the six peaks in a day. Did you really? Yeah, it was, a, it was a really big day. We had a good time. And, so I'd say the hiking has been the top we of the list. We won't do it again. We won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not in one day. Not yeah. in one day. Not in one day. Kind of we went on a hike one time. You've gotten a lot. You've graduated we've, quite we've a bit. Gotten, Dana will attest to this. We've gotten better uh, at our fitness. Yeah. Our fitness level one. has improved. Yeah. 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 Let's go on a hike again. We can yeah. maybe hang with you now. Just yeah. maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Yeah. Uh, so I put hiking at the top of my list. What would wow. you think? Well, when we came over here um, to visit because I had never been to Maine. I was like, we're going to move to Maine. Then I need to at least go visit once. Um, and so at the near took me to see a, a lighthouse, a moose at Gray. Um, 
you know, the, <laughs> the, great, wildlife, park. the wildlife park um, and the ocean. And then we met all these amazing people that were all very different and eclectic just by happenstance. And so when we're in the jet port at the end, I was like, okay, I'm sold on Maine, but really how much did you pay all these actors? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think for me, it was the people that I met. I liked how um, quirky and kind and genuine everyone was. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. With the, uh, um, and, and either, you, you both are so accomplished. Like, have you ever failed at anything? I think about like, I always tell kids when I'm meeting with kids, I said, look, I failed my driver's test the first time. I was devastated. You'll, you'll, do, you'll be fine if you do something like that. Just because everybody's failed something, right? So have you guys failed anything? All the time. All the time, okay. yeah. I mean, but something like, you know, like a driver's um, test. Uh, yeah, I yeah, get I things mean, on grants all the time. I get papers rejected. I get not enough, not as many students I'd like signing up for my class. You know, there's all the time I get rejected, yeah. I think Kara and I both have the same philosophy, which is that if you're not <laughs> failing at things, you're not putting yourself out there enough. Yep. Um, that's and that's something I, I believe really, really strongly. Um, you know, I, uh, I grew up playing chess, and that was, that was my thing. I wasn't that great at it, but I really enjoyed it. So that's definitely right there in the category of things that I, I failed at, but I enjoyed it. And my father used to say, that in a competitive chess match, or any chess game, there are really fundamentally only two outcomes. Um, either you win or you earn something. Mm. And, and so that's how I take a look at most things. I, I fail at things all the time. Uh, ideas that I'm pushing up the chain, federally or in the state, I get a big red X on them. I, you know, uh, ideas that I have for programs, strategies, initiatives, grants that we apply for at the main CDC, that I put time and effort into, we fail all the time. But to me, that's evidence of the fact that we're putting ourselves out there appropriately, yeah. not that we're, and rather than being too conservative in things. That's so, a great, that's a great yeah, philosophy. I mean, we, I, I fall down all the time. Um, I think what Kara and I are really good at is picking ourselves back up. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what I think we are particularly good at. So one more question, and then I think we'll turn it over to the audience, right? So um, what's the craziest adventure you've ever had, the two of you? Oh, the two of us together? Hmm. Oh, that's uh, an interesting one. That's we interesting. We have some crazy adventures separately. Well, let me just say that I do want to go to Cambodia with you, and I want you to go to Africa with me, because mm -hmm. I think we've had very crazy adventures separately. Um, what's the craziest thing we've done together besides, besides getting married? This pandemic and <laughs> yeah, going through. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what do you think? Getting a dog together <laughs> <laughs> for only three and a half months. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I I think so. We've done we've we've had the privilege of being on some pretty crazy adventures. The bulk of them, I think, center around road trips. Uh, picking up on a Saturday morning and saying, "Hey, let's go to." Texas, when we lived in Chicago, let's throw the dog in the car and let's just go see what's going on and go wow. check in and surprise our family. It's kind of like a Sunday drive, isn't it? And it, it, it's, it, it's an extended drive, but the stops along the way and the just completely bizarro uh, situations that we found ourselves in, those are some of our best adventures, I think. That's uh, good. Yeah, I think also we trained across India too. Which oh, yeah. Cool. You yeah. did what again? We took trains we took across, across India. India. <sighs> That was because your parents are from India. Yeah, right? both yeah. my mom and dad. Where were they from in India? My uh, my parents were both from Gujarat in Western India. Yeah. Um, but through our visits there, we one day decided to just take the trains across India, and that's wow. not for the faint of heart. Also, not first class, uh, which is also not for the faint, faint of heart. heart. But um, wow. we made it through. We that's made fun. it through. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Because your parents had moved back to India, right, for a time, and then they came yeah, back Yeah, after here. my dad retired uh, many years ago, they moved back to India. When he started getting sick, they moved back to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so they had, been, they had had the opportunity to go back and forth yeah. quite a bit. And your mom is a common uh, household uh, yeah. visitor of the Pella Mountain Shaw household. Yeah, She's, she spends States. about half of her year, yeah. half of her year up here and then the other half down in Texas, the colder months down there and the warmer months here. Yeah, so. she's, she's wonderful. Yeah. So what kind of questions do you all have? Um, okay, do we have microphones? Yes. 
So David is going over with a microphone, David Webster. Thank you, David. I, yeah, can I take, can I take my, can I take my mask off? It'll be easier. Hi, Dr. Mills. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Way up by your mouth, I think. Right there? Is that working? It seems to be on, but I can repeat it if you. I can hear you okay. Go for it. Okay. Repeat the question. I, I spent 35 years in the Attorney General's office, oh, and I did some it. work. Oh, that's, sorry. I just, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's Chris Layton. Chris, hi, Chris. Yeah, Good right. to see you. And I, I did some legal work for public health off and on. And yes, of, you and I worked together. Very, yes. very strong. And one of the things we, every three years or so, we'd have a, a drug-resistant TB case. Yes. Oh, I where, remember those. Where, <laughs> where public health would jump into action to corral that, get it under control, and protect us. And that's just an example of something that public health does that I don't think anybody knows about. So Dr. Shah and, and Dr. Mills, uh, what are the things that public health do that most people don't know about but are important to oh, our welfare? What a fantastic question. You know, there's, there's a saying that, in effect, public health saved your life today. You just don't know it. Um, and, and that's because prevention is a very difficult constituency to make public. Um, when everything, when you plan ahead for something that you know is coming, and you get the funding to set up a program that mitigates the risk and diffuses that risk before it causes any harm, before anyone sees it, it's very, very, very easy for those who wish to be skeptical of you to say, well, that wasn't a big deal. I mean, you ask for all that money, you do all that stuff, nothing even happened. Well, yeah, that's because we did our jobs. And public health, unfortunately, is typified and struck with that curse. We do our best when nothing happens, right? When the water that you, owe, you, you, you know, for that comes out of your tap doesn't contain cholera, that's a win. When the restaurant you went out to eat at didn't give you E. coli, that's a win. And it's this entire panoply of things, as Chris noted, when someone who's diagnosed with a multi-drug resistant form of TB is not roaming the streets and in a shelter, but rather in a safe, supportive place where they can heal quietly, that's a win, but it's just not in the news. And so this is, I think, a fundamental challenge, especially around getting prevention work funded. Because to the skeptics, it appears that it's much ado about nothing. We ask for all this money, we do all this work, and then nothing happens. Even though that's the design, that's the feature, not the bug. And so public health has this entire invisible force field that we've created around well-functioning states like Maine, where we take care of people at the population level, but no one knows. That's our challenge. We used to say success in public health is silent. It's very silent. Yeah. Very yes, silent. there's somebody over here, and I think David is running around with a, with a microphone. Getting my walk in for the day. And thanks, Chris, for your service. You've been, in, I know, in state service for a lot of years, so thank you. Chris okay, so um, two questions. What, I have the impression that Africa is like the hotbed for viruses and whatnot. Is it? And the and second question is, to what extent do you think climate change is going to really um, be influencing more of these monkey poxes or whatever? Um, yeah, so the majority of reasons why people die in Africa are different than why people might die here. Um, and in recent years, that has been shifting from sort of communicable diseases, which is viruses, that sort of thing, to non-communicable diseases, um, such as you know, heart disease, cancer, those sorts of things. Um, so Africa is shifting a bit. Um, and getting HIV virus under control. Um, but that's how I think why um, surveillance and being able to detect um, through genomic sequencing when unique viruses are coming out and really for viruses that we know, it, we know what to do with, making sure that there's outbreak control available. Um, and for new diseases, making sure we do have the ability to sequence and share that information so that we can develop new vaccines, drugs, um, and uh, therapeutics, that sort of thing. Um, 
But I think Africa has really shown that you can control a virus like HIV um, when you do put the resources towards it. And so I don't think that, I think we have that infrastructure and the platform from HIV to, to leverage and control other viruses. Yep, I mean, um, on one level, a lot of emerging pathogens do come out of lower and middle income countries, whether it's sub-Saharan Africa, South, Af uh, South, uh, South America, in the case of Zika virus, COVID-19 in Western China, they do come out of lower and middle income resource countries. Uh, there are numerous and varied reasons for that. Uh, they have to do with the close relationship between humans and animals coexisting, living in close quarters. They have to do with increasing urbanization, myriad factors that drive that. But Kara's right, writ large, Emerging infectious pathogens are not the primary causes of death, but they are where many of these emanate. And some of these viruses are quite concerning. Uh, they have names that go by, the th by things like Marburg virus and Rift Valley fever, Ebola, one that we know of. So they do emanate from there. It's all the more reason why the notion that we should focus our preparedness just on the United States is incredibly short-sighted. Your point about climate change is very, very important. Climate change will undoubtedly drive more of these events. Climate change works in unfortunately <laughs> nefarious ways. It changes migration patterns. So it means that the farm communities where people used to be are drying up. So they're moving into urban centers, often with their animals, for example. So you have these closer linkages and each one of those increases significantly the likelihood that a virus that only transmitted among animals will make the leap over into humans. Other questions? Um, yes, I think Elizabeth. Oh, oh, somebody here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Uh, so the, the 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 question was, how do I paraphrase that question? Uh, the the question was a very thoughtful question about how things have unfolded in Maine. And, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, and, and, and I'll, I'll let Kara weigh in on this. Let, let me, uh, suffice it to say, when, when, we, when we moved to Maine, uh, none of us had a global pandemic in, in, our, in our view. Um, that being said, you know, um, the reception that people in Maine have offered us and the welcome mat that you've rolled out has been nothing short of remarkable. You know, I mean, we're not, neither of us is from Maine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from northern Wisconsin. Kara's from Houston, Texas. Um, the fact that the two of us could be here for a sum total of six months uh, prior to there being a, a pandemic that shattered people's confidence in the institutions that they knew and grow, had grown accustomed to uh, and then for me, a brown guy with a funny name from Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, to show up on TV and not have people say, I'm turning that off, but rather say, you know what, that guy, I don't know if I agree with him or not, but I'm going to give him another shot. Uh, I think that, that that tells you a lot more about people here uh, than it does about us. Um, so, That's nice. yeah, we, um, it's, been, it's been more than gratifying, more than you'll ever know. Thank you. I also knew that you were finally a Mainer because it was about a year you'd been here, maybe 10 months, and finally it went about two weeks where your name was not spelled S-H-A-W. Yeah. <laughs> <And it was, Yeah. laughs> the first few months, everybody spelled his name S-H-A-W. I was like, no, there's a different type of shot. <laughs> no, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> so, it's okay. So, it's all right. So, Elizabeth, you've got a very much, Dr. Shaw. My name is Elizabeth McClellan, and I'm uh, the founder of Partners for World Health. And I want to thank both of you and Dr. Mills for their great presentation this evening. I think your comment recently, uh, just a few minutes ago, about how viruses can spread for when there's climate change and bringing people that are in the rural areas into the city, and then you have this onset of this in incredible creation of a virus. But I want to talk a little bit about your views on what is our responsibility as, a, as our country in terms of global health. Yes. Kara, why, why don't you start? <clears throat> sure. Well, I think you can look at it a couple of different ways. Um, Ultimately, the health of 
people anywhere on this planet, we're all very interconnected. And a disease that is harbored in Chicago or originated in Canada or South Africa or wherever it might be, it's only a plane ride uh, away. And so really building the system globally um, to be able to detect those things and respond to them is in all of our best interests. Um, so just taking a national focus or a state focus we've seen doesn't work. We have to all work together because borders are porous and people are free to move. And so really thinking about how we can all work together is it actually in our, all of our best interest. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an interesting dilemma, a, a, a sea change that has started to occur, particularly in global health. And that is the move to, and, and the term that is used is to decolonize global health. Uh, effectively to take the decision making, the drivers, away from those in the West and restore that to those who are in the countries whom we are trying to assist. And, and that raises some interesting challenges. So as a first principle, I think it is reasonable to say that the United States has an obligation to assist lesser known parts of the world, either for pure humanitarian interests or for our own interests to prevent things from coming to our shore. That is, I think, largely an un well, a, a not that controversial position. But when you square it up against two other facts, it becomes harder to operationalize. The first is this move to, deco to, to, to decolonize. If our obligation is to indeed be engaged, what does that look like? Is it to call the shots and say, okay, Nigeria or Kenya or Malawi or Tanzania, this is what you must do henceforth in order to maintain public health. That's a difficult conversation. Maybe it's around funding if it's not around operational assistance. There too, there's a lot of movement afoot to make sure that those countries are not reliant upon the largesse of the United States, but rather able to fund these initiatives on their own. So those two somewhat, they, they come somewhat headlong against each other. Then. What, another thing that puts it in stark relief right now is with respect to the monkeypox vaccine. It's just one example. There are such a limited number of doses. Uh, how we allocate those across the United States where there is a significant outbreak, Western Europe and then in Sub-Saharan Africa, where at least this current outbreak originated, how you make that allocation decision, essentially how you go from saying, yes, we should help, to then saying, okay, great, what does that look like? That, that is very, very difficult. I've, I've had the privilege of being in some of those calls. It's not obviously my, my primary purview at all, but just as an observer and a listener. And, and those discussions are very challenging, very challenging. Thank you. Uh, take an opportunity to ask a question. Sure. And I will bring this back to you, ma'am. Um, we are facing upcoming elections. It becomes election era a period in the next several months. What, think together with us, what are the questions we wish to ask candidates in order to protect and maintain public health? Well, um, I'll start, and, and Dora and Kara, please, please weigh in. I, I think that the question that is on my mind, it, is, it, it references what I spoke about earlier. Um, I, th I think a principal question, and, and let me be very clear, this is at the federal level. Uh, not, not, not something that is particular to, to states. But at the federal level, the question that I have been chatting about with federal colleagues is what efforts will be afoot to fund public health in a properly sustainable manner? Again, we've pinioned public health funding from times of feast then to times of famine based on the disease that was most pressing at the time. And I think the question is, what efforts are there or should there be to ensure that funding for public health is both, ro both robust as well as level? Yeah, couldn't say it any better. That's great. Thanks, David. And there's somebody else that had a question over here. Hi. Oh, over here. Um, I wanted to ask about the, uh, during COVID, the Boston area took a look at wastewater and they used that as a predictor of COVID, which was very interesting looking at it from a national level. Now, most recently, we've got this polio that showed up, again, with this wastewater thing. So I was interested in twofold. In the United States, is that something that public health, like 
the states do on a regular basis to monitor that thing? And then in Africa, do they have the infrastructure to be able to do something like that? Because it seems like a pretty positive way to monitor those kinds of things. Do you want to start? No. Oh, I'll, I'll start with the, the U.S. piece. Um, we, we do it here as well in Maine. Uh, we have 27 sites across the state that routinely, at least weekly, in some cases twice a week, uh, monitor their wastewater primarily for COVID, but now increasingly other infectious diseases. In the case of Portland, monkeypox, and then we're bringing other infectious diseases online elsewhere. The tool has promise. There are some scientific, technical, data-related <coughs> questions that are very difficult to understand, i.e., what do the data mean? If you go from 0000, zero, zero, zero to 10,000, what does that mean? What are you going to do with that? Uh, that's a difficult policy question. But the promise of wastewater testing is one that uh, I'm behind. That's why we have so many sites in Maine. Um, I think our challenge will be making sure that those data are tethered to actions in some manner. Yeah, and, and just in Africa, they have the capabilities. They have people that can run the equipment and the equipment uh, in very centralized um, laboratories. Um, to do that. I just don't think they have the resources to add on to what they're already doing um, for either HIV or TB responses. So I think they need additional funding to support something like that. But they definitely have the know-how um, and the equipment to do it. Hi. Um, I just wondered if you could comment briefly on the news coming out of the CV CDC, Dr. Walensky stating that kind of sort of dropped the ball and maybe should have acted a little faster. In the idea of restructuring the national CDC, is that something that you could comment on? And then second, very quickly, with your crystal ball, could you tell us whether you think there is a decent chance of a much worse COVID variant coming in the next 12 months? OK. Uh, let, let me start with the latter question and then, and then the former. Uh, Acknowledging very freely that I retired my crystal ball quite some time ago because it was as often wrong as it was right. Um, there is, there is a, a, the possibility of a more virulent strain of COVID-19 emerging in the next six months, 12 months, cannot be ruled out. Uh, we have been somewhat accustomed to the notion that each successive strain it's just a little bit milder than the other one. Maybe it spreads more easily, but it's not like the Delta variant that we contended with a year ago. Omicron and its various progeny have been, in some respects, milder, uh, although milder compared to what? But so the possibility, uh, so we should not take from that that viral evolution is a one-way ratchet. Uh, it is entirely within the realm of possibility that the next variant, whatever it may be, whatever Greek letter is assigned to it, will in fact be both just as transmissible, if not more communicable, and more virulent than what we've seen before. What that chance is, no one knows. And anyone who tells you they do is just pulling numbers out. We have to be, and that's why the genomic sequencing that Kara referenced earlier is so critical. Make note, the Omicron variant was first characterized in South Africa. No one's sure whether it emerged there. But because they have invested heavily in DNA sequencing technology, a laboratory in South Africa was the first laboratory to characterize it. So making those continued investments in what's called disease surveillance is really, really critical. Uh, as to the announcements that, the, that Dr. Walensky made earlier today, um, I, I applaud her for taking a hard look at both the nature of their response as well as the nature of their organization. As I referenced earlier, uh, you know, we, we have an obligation to ask hard questions. Uh, we've, we do that regularly within the main CDC after just about everything. We have a series of meetings. They are called hot washes and then after action reports uh, where we sit down and ask the hard questions about what went well and what did not go well. Uh, I, I, think, I think the director is on the right path with taking a look at how the CDC should move away from being nominally an academic organization, which is in many respects how many there see it, to a much more public health response organization. Dr. Shaw, 
I understood that there's a new vaccine coming out for some of the latest variants for COVID. Do you anticipate COVID going down the road of the flu where every year or six months there'll be a new vaccine and every flu season, which presumably may be in the fall or COVID season when people are getting back together, that you and public health and everyone else will encourage us to go out and get the latest COVID vaccine for the year? Will this go on for years to come as in your crystal ball? It's before you retire it. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> every, <laughs> every now and then I try to give a one word answer. It's hard for me, but you packaged it up so nicely, sir. The answer is yes. Uh, it, is, it is probable that perhaps it's starting as soon as this October, there will be an annually or semi-annually updated COVID booster shot with the latest and greatest virus, much as we see with the, the influenza vaccine. So whether that is twice a year or every other year remains to be seen. But the answer to your question fundamentally is yes. My name is Mary Ann Sandrini Taggart, and I'm director of a nonprofit that works in public health here. In, we're from Maine, but we work in Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, other countries in Africa too. And we've encountered problems with technology, mostly because of the electrical problems over there. And we also work with the national CDC. We have a conference coming up, um, including with Dr. Henry Walkie, who led the pandemic response. It's in two weeks and is all about the lessons learned. It's going to be particularly interesting because of today's uh, announcements from CDC. But my question is, we have no connections here in Maine. And when we've tried to reach out, I don't know, it hasn't worked. So I wish there was some kind of forum for organizations in Maine who work in public health to get together to share what they do and to help each other. I don't know if you know of anything that I'm unaware Let's of. Let's start one. Yeah. Yeah. Our own <clears throat> journal club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I love it. You might yeah. meet somebody. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Are you married? <laughs> Oh, you guys aren't looking. <laughs> no, no, but like, you know, you never know. I'll talk to you afterwards. We can. Uh... Yeah. What's the name yeah. of your organization again? It's the Eagleson Institute, and uh, we're located in Sanford, Maine. That's our headquarters. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But there is the Maine Public Health Association, which is a branch of the American Public Health Association, and they have an annual meeting mm -hmm. that's coming up. Um, they, they haven't had traditionally a much of a so much of a global focus, but there's no reason they couldn't. And I mean, Elizabeth McClellan was speaking, asking a question a few minutes ago, and she runs the Partners for yeah. World Health that's here right. in Maine as well. So it seems like there's a need. So maybe right. we could do something with the MPHA or, um, or as uh, Kara said, maybe uh, something new. Maybe start something. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. I'm writing it Thank down. Thank you. <laughs> Eagleton Institute. E-E-A-G-L-E-S-O-N. Okay. I have some information with me I can give to you. <laughs> Eagle Sun. Yeah, it's in my not, With an S, not a T. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Really great idea. Mm -hmm. And there's also the, um, the uh, what's the, uh, oh my goodness, um, blanking, the, the World Affairs Council, that WAC, yeah, World Affairs Council, which does have sometimes has speakers and sometimes has a health uh, focus too. So maybe there's a, anyway, some leveraging there of existing organizations. Great. I thought I'd change the, quest the, um, the questions um, a little bit by asking this one. Do you um, see the ubiquitous presence of PFAS oh. Oh. Um, as a public health issue? And are you hearing any strategies at the federal level, you probably know about this, the, the state level, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, that, uh, God, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, whew, uh, the answer to the former question, is it a public health concern, is, is, is definitely and squarely yes. Um, quantifying that the risk level uh, that, that PFAS chemicals present is, is an interesting challenge, and our, our team of toxicologists uh, has, uh, has, has been working on helping quantify precisely what we know about PFAS exposure and the subsequent attendant effects on things like cancers and such. But the, the square answer to your question uh, is yes, and we've had the, the opportunity uh, to, to make sure that Governor Mills is fully informed on where we stand. As you're probably aware, uh, early, earlier in the Mills administration, the PFAS task force 
came together to make sure that we were coordinating, and now we, we move more into action. Uh, from the federal level, I've been, I've been uh, I don't want to say I'm overwhelmed, but I'm whelmed by the response at, at the federal level. I, do, I don't believe that what we've seen um, adequately captures the need for uh, either the, the US EPA or a wing of the CDC that focuses on toxic substances. I, I don't believe that their, their, their call to action has been loud enough. Uh, I'm proud of the response that we've had in Maine, uh, whether it's the, uh, the Maine CDC's response uh, or uh, the Department of the Environmental Protection's response. Uh, I feel like we've been aggressive at testing, providing guidance out there, putting advisories out, whether it relates to consumption of fish and such. But uh, in many respects, P the PFAS issue will be with us for quite some time, and we're just now getting into it. It's going to be interesting to see with the National Academies of Science report that but came out, it came out. federal yeah. responses to that, mm. recommending testing mm -hmm. people. Yes. So, which we don't... Ah, uh, what is PFAS? Okay, so you guys have until midnight or so, <laughs> I assume. Uh, I'll, I, will, I, will, I will attempt to summarize it uh, and, and, and encapsulate the issue in, in as few sentences as possible. Uh, for a few decades now, uh, there have been a number of chemicals, literally thousands of, uh, of, of a family of chemicals, that are in wide use ubiquitously. Uh, and these are the chemicals that form the compounds that we all know, like Teflon, nonstick uh, surfaces, Gore-Tex, uh, stain-resistant carpeting. All of these involve a category of compounds <coughs> called PFAS. They were used in consumer goods as well as in industrial applications, like in firefighting foam and naval applications. Uh, in recent years, they've been found to have certain and probable links to endo end endocrine system disruptions, as well as up to and including potentially being linked to some cancers. So there's now a movement to, foot to better understand where they are around us, in our water, in our streams, in our food, and then try to figure out who should be tested and what to do about that. And the sludge. And the sludge, and oh boy, yeah. Other questions? Oh, there. Hi. Um, this has been great. Thank you very much. I am one, well, two things. One is a comment about the nature of international research and the work that you're doing, Kara. And I'm wondering whether there's any underlying assumption that maybe what you're doing will come back to the US since. You know, we have a high infant mortality rate, supposedly, compared to other that is a great countries. And then the other thing is I'm interested in the relationship between the national CDC and the state level CDCs and how that interaction works, the relationship. Great questions. Great. Um, Great question. Um, so the reverse, right? If you design for a really tough environment, can that technology potentially make its way back here? Maybe we're designing for extreme affordability, extreme ease of use. And the answer is yes. I mean, I think with the point of care PCR instruments what, and, and, and some of the antigen tests um, that uh, they form the basis of a lot of the COVID tests um, that I think exist now. So one of the things that we've worked on was a point of care PCR test for HIV. Um, but we took that platform and, and developed a 15 minute COVID test for PCR. And so we're in the process of taking that technology and it introduces a whole new realm of possibilities for PCR technology. So you can run it in a Walgreens or uh, a physician's office versus sending it to Quest Diagnostics and really turning around a result rapidly. So um, I think it's inspired us to kind of think hard with these extreme environments. And then in some cases, yes, there are uses for, for the technology. So, and in some cases, no. So we have phototherapy lights that treat jaundice. And this is just a blue light um, that's existed in, in newborn wards here in the U.S. for, for decades. And so something like that, that work runs off of a battery, well, it might be used for like transport, that sort of thing, maybe home use. Um, uh, oxygen concentrators are another example. In some cases with, with, in hospitals without piped oxygen, you can use oxygen concentrators instead. And those can have a home use here in the US uh, for people that need oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and to your, your latter question, the, the structural relationship 
between state departments of health and the US CDC is, is one of collegiality and one of funding. Uh, so I report to Governor Mills. She calls the shots in the state of Maine. We get advice and counsel from the US CDC as to whether we ought to go left or right. But that decision is ultimately the chief executive, Governor Mills's decision. Uh, that being said, the CDC does fund a, quite a bit of our work, as they do with state health departments across the country. Uh, but, that but the strategic decisions are ultimately that of the governor, in this case, Governor Mills. And I'll just add real quickly to the, uh, you were mentioning the test kits, I believe, and the kind of the two-way street globally that happens. I was just looking it up. I'm pretty sure it's Abbott that manufactures the malaria antigen tests that are widely used in Africa. When I was at University of New England, and uh, President Her Herbert's here, um, James Herbert, we, we went to, there's an annual trip to Ghana that takes students, and we took these Abbott tests there. And it was just fascinating to just a drop of blood, just like with the COVID test, only it's mm -hmm. a blood test. And you could see what, uh, if they had malaria and what type of malaria it was. And it was antigen tests, just like the COVID test, but manufactured in Scarborough, Maine, by <laughs> Abbott. So there's, you know, we really are in a much smaller world than we used to be. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, those, those rapid sort of, I guess I always call them like pregnancy tests. Yeah. Um, and now everyone knows them as the COVID antigen home tests. Um, yes. But yeah, they're, that format is beautiful. It can be yeah. used anywhere by anyone, anytime. And actually, it, they have HIV antibody tests where it's a drop of blood on a, a stick of uh, just a little small Listen. piece of paper. In 15 yeah. minutes, um, you, you know your results. Yeah. So those Amazing. types of lateral flow technologies are, are really great. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So I've just got a question on sort of the collaboration aspect. I don't know too much about public health, but I do work on international climate and where we see changes in environmental patterns leading to outbreaks of disease and bringing people in. And um, also polar work where we're having, you know, PFAS chemicals that are found in Antarctica and mm -hmm. like people aren't there, but the chemicals are getting there. And how do you sort of get this all together? So just wondering whether you can say anything about sort of the collaborative efforts of something like public health. When you mentioned earlier that public health is one of those that it's, you know, it's going well when you don't know what's going on mm -hmm. from at least my side. <laughs> uh, so how do you, who do you have in the room? How do you decide who needs to be there? How do you do that at sort of an international level, a local level? How, I mean, I can imagine sort of the fun, you know, when you talked a little bit about funding, but when you're looking at a huge international thing that's, you know, to prove the necessity of it, but to get ahead of things that are happening and, you know, something like PFAS in Antarctica, that's, you can't really go to the community and try to figure out what they're doing. So, you know, whether that's not necessarily that we're looking at public health there, but when you're looking at these remote regions that are very integral to bringing everybody together. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's a great question. I think creating a sense of, I think fundamentally what your question's at, asking is like, how do you create a sense of urgency maybe where there's not a sense of urgency? And I, I think that is a really difficult question. We struggle with it with newborn care all the time. How do we create a sense of urgency for these babies? Because they're not activists. They're not organized. Um, and the same way, same way some other communities are. So I think um, we always look to what the HIV community did and try to emulate um, what they did to raise awareness because they did such a phenomenal job of organizing and creating awareness around that issue. But if I had all the answers, I, I, I think I, I don't. Um, but it's a really difficult issue. And I think bringing, I think people sometimes that need to solve a problem don't all come from the same discipline. And so making sure the jargon is taken out of those conversations where it's just not a group of experts talking about their expertise, but really that cross-disciplinary. So if it is talking with folks in Antarctica or, or remote regions and including them in the conversation, making sure that their voice is heard and making sure that the jargon is taken out of it and ultimately you're focused on the same problem that you're trying to solve. Kind of a simplistic question, but 
with uh, everyone doing their own COVID tests at, at home, and how are you generating uh, statistics on the incidence of COVID? That's a great question. Uh, but, but, uh, how do you have any idea about how many people are actually infected? Yep, that's a very good question. Um, so there's a few answers. The first is it's true. There's a lot of at-home testing. Uh, and, and the fundamental question is, do we think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and the answer, I think, is very much that we think it's a good thing, even though it has the drawback of us not having full visibility into everyone being tested. Uh, early on, before antigen tests, we knew exactly every single person in the United States who's getting tested every day and had the data from that. Uh, we've had to let some things go, and that's okay. So the question then becomes, is what we've let go detrimental to our models such that we don't know what's going on? And the answer there is, is to some degree, yes, but not as much as you might think. First of all, there's still a lot of PCR testing happening. Our laboratory, just the main CDC lab, just our lab, still does three to 400 COVID tests a day. These are PCR tests. To say nothing of Quest, LabCorp, Nordex. Main Health, Nordex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is still an incredible amount of testing happening. From the results of that PCR testing, uh, even though it's a subset, a sample, we can still piece together a very good epidemiological picture when, in our models, we, we combine it with other sources of data, namely wastewater data as well as hospitalization data. Uh, so even though we've lost a little bit because of the absence of, at home, of, 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 of all the PCR be testing being done, it is, it is not so statistically damaging to the model that we're flying blind. Uh, all that being said, the other secondary question is, how do I put this? Do daily cases tell us anything about the nature of the pandemic? And the answer is not really. Uh, the metrics that really tell us where we are and where we're going are no longer cases. Uh, they really, uh, hospitalizations are a much finer metric uh, as we think about where the pandemic is, the impact that it's having, and what trends it might see. So uh, when, I, when I take a look at the data every day, the new number of cases is pretty low on the list. It's the structure of hospitalizations that I'm interested in. And we share, I mean, the, hospital oh, yeah. system, the health systems, we're in. They report the, the data contact. to us. And, 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 so. and it looks, and the data that we look at has evolved. So, I mean, things like, um, so we, Nordic's lab at Maine Health is doing about 500 tests a day. Mm -hmm. We test everybody who's admitted to the hospital mm -hmm. or before surgeries and major procedures. And out of that, we get what's called an asymptomatic test positivity rate that mm -hmm. you and I talk about quite a bit because it's really interesting. It's basically if you were walking down Main Street and you just tested people who had no symptoms and how many are positive and they didn't know it. And it's been running about right now about two and a half to three percent. So, you know, that's about one in 30 to one in 40 people mm -hmm. are just so in this room. So what are there like 80 people or so? There are going to be a couple people in here yeah. who have COVID and don't know they have it. Mm -hmm. Don't have symptoms. So um, we know. We know. <laughs> we, know. <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> I think that question about the rock star should have been a comedian or something. <laughs> but yeah, and then we also look at our hospitalizations differently because about half to two thirds are coincidental right now or hospital acquired. They've been. They've been in the hospital for a couple of weeks and we're allowing visitors, visitors often when they get in the room don't mask. You get semi-private rooms, you get some, you know, people, people contracting it after they've been in the hospital. But most of that is, a lot of it is uh, um, on admission too, that, that coincidentally positive. So, so that's also a, a barometer of what's out in the community. And when that, those numbers go up in the proportion of people who are coincidentally positive or getting it from visitors, that just kind of tells you how gives you a barometer how much is in the community. So it's, anyway, so it's we're just looking at data differently, yeah. but you still get a pulse on things. The last question of the night. And um, we have two esteemed doctors on the stage. Uh, and you're both in network tonight. So my question for the two of you is, are you, are we experiencing vaccine fatigue? And if so, what advice can you give all your patients in this room about the importance of vaccines? 
including a flu shot? Um, I, I will start, and then Dora is really the, the only real doctor on the stage. Yeah. Um, the, um, so you're right, Tom, at the outset, we are seeing that with each new vaccine that comes out, with each successive booster, the uptake, the demand uh, is, is a bit lower than the last one. Uh, that's unfortunate because, it, it, to the gentleman's prior question about what the future of vaccination holds, it generates the concern that when we do have a new and updated booster in the fall, uh, the uptake may not be sufficiently robust to stave off any potential surge. So that's a concern. Uh, what, 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 I've, what I've indicated to people is particularly around the pediatric vaccine, which is an area of focus of mine. Uh, Two weeks ago, I was up in the county, and then on Monday and Tuesday of this week, in Washington County and Hancock County. And we visited, my team and I visited health clinics in Washington County, as well as one in Hancock County, that had administered thus far zero pediatric vaccines. Zero, so far. For COVID. For COVID-19. They have it on hand. They offer it to every patient. They frame it as one of the required vaccines or recommended vaccines that your child is gonna to get today, but the opt-out rate in some clinics is nearing 100%. Actually, we were in, in Buxton yesterday, and um, I'm sorry, in, in, in Berwick, and they had just yesterday morning administered their very first pediatric COVID oh shot. My gosh. So I'm, I'm, con I'm very concerned about that, particularly as we think about going back to school. So what I have indicated, and, and what I hope resonates, and maybe what you can share with parents you know who are skeptical, is um, why don't you trust pediatricians on this? You trust your child's pediatrician for everything. Asthma, broken bones, when they have a runny nose, when they have a fever. These are the people you entrust with your child's life and health. And you trust them for everything except COVID-19 vaccines. I don't know a single pediatrician who wasn't first in line to get their kids vaccinated. Why would you not trust them when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine when you trust them for everything else? To put it differently, we should all emulate what we want. Uh, we, we should all emulate what our doctors do. Same question when my mom is needing care. I ask the doctor, look, what would you do if this was your mom? And that's usually what I go with. And I ask parents to do the same thing when it comes to vaccinating their kids. To ask their pediatrician, what would you do if this were your kid? And every pediatrician I know has vaccinated their kids. I hope that helps get some people off the fence and get their, their kids vaccinated. Dora? No, I, I'm originally a pediatrician, and yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. It's just, it's just astonishing. Um, and I think you know, we have had a concurrent pandemic of misinformation and distrust mm -hmm. in science. And it's, um, it's disheartening because you just know that we've had tragedies because of it. And with young children, right now in the U.S., the leading cause of infectious disease deaths is COVID. People think, oh, the kids just get a cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the vast majority of kids who get COVID do well, they do fine, but, it is, but not all of them do. And they're not also, we, it's not always the kids that are um, at risk. In fact, most of the kids who get severely ill, we've seen, have no risk factors. Yeah. They're just children. Um, and so it is the people at the very, you know, the older people and very young people who are, most, who are big, mostly impacted severely by this disease. Now, that wasn't the case early on. The kids were, it was for some reason not really affecting the children that much in the first few months, but then it evolved, it mutated. Mm -hmm. And it's different. So, you know, it's our leading infectious disease cause of death in this country, and yet we can't get parents to vaccinate their kids. So you may not have children that are young enough to get vaccinated of that age group or the uh, young children, but you, you have grandkids maybe, or nieces and nephews, please, if there's one thing you can do today is to please go home and, and, and encourage them to get vaccinated. And I just want to end, Tom, um, with one thing is that I didn't ask this question because I assumed somebody would, and nobody did, but it's related, Tom. So um, what are you doing about masking? Because I know it's like half the people are masked, half are aren't, so. I don't know. Someone do needs to come up with some rules on that. <laughs> <laughs> like someone needs to be out there giving some advice <laughs> on what to do. So what are you doing these days? Uh, so I'll, I'll, share, I'll share with just what, what I do, and Kara can share her perspective. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we are in a room, uh, normally uh, when I'm in an indoor public setting, whether it's the grocery store, uh, we went to a concert not long ago, 
I, I do mask. It's not. Yeah. It's it's above and beyond what the requirements are or the re recommendations are. And so I don't take this to to suggest that those who don't are derelict in some manner. Um, but you know, I act. I interact with a lot of people every day between my staff, uh, aging parents, etc. Kara and and I. The last thing I want to do is to be yeah. a vector. So that's personally what I do. But that need not be what everyone else does. How about you, Kara? Uh, same. I mean, yeah. um, if I'm in the grocery store on a 35-hour flight <laughs> to, yeah. to to Malawi, I wore a mask the whole time. Yeah. Um, and I was I was in 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 some plane rides the only one. Uh, in some yeah. other plane rides, mainly the African ones, I, a lot of people wear masks. Mm -hmm. Um, it depends yeah. on so many other factors. I mean, yes, ventilation. You know, if, if, there's, if there's a robust amount of ventilation, the front yeah. doors are wide open, that goes yeah. in one direction. Yeah. So it is difficult. Look, look I'll, I'll be the first to acknowledge, making that calculus is not easy. It's an uncertain time. I agree. And I'm doing the same thing. I go to the grocery store, and it's, especially if it's crowded, I put my mask on. But the other day, I went into Hannaford, and I forgot to put my mask yeah. on. I got in there, and I thought, well, there's hardly anybody here. I'm not going to go back out and get it. Yeah. Um, so... You know, but then like I went to my college reunion a couple months ago at Bowdoin and I thought, oh, I should probably be masking because it was kind of crowded and we were indoors. And I thought, you know what? I haven't seen people in five years. I just, I took the risk. I knocked on wood. I didn't get COVID either. So, but they're just, as you said, the calculus is, it's ventilation and whether you think people are, you know, vaccinated and, and what your own risk factors are and all that. But then sometimes it's just like, okay, it's my college reunion. I'm I'm not going to mask. You know, there's just, sometimes there's an emotional factor too. So I, I don't fault people. Yeah. For for any of that. Yeah. So. No, that's great. And I just have to say, on a personal note, um, I think you know this pandemic has been so challenging for all of us. It's been a time of of isolation at times and and fear and just huge challenges. And there's always also been these silver linings. And for me, and I know for many of us in the audience, the silver lining for us in Maine has been this guy here. And we're oh. this guy. <laughs> that's, that's very kind of you. Very, very kind of you. And and now you know the real secret behind Narav <laughs> Shah with yes. his yes. wife, Kara. <laughs> And this one ain't bad, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are allowed to have it. <laughs> Last note, if you take a look at your Shah bars, they spelled bar wrong. It's ba. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. for our future events, our next events. A wonderful new face so many new faces here tonight. Thank you all for coming and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>